can also burn St. George's Parish Church in Dorchester, which is currently located in the Dorchester State Park in Somerville, and the Church of Christ Church Parish. There's what remains of St. George's Parish Church, its location. The British targeted St. Michael's in Charleston, and by that point it had been painted black to try to disguise it. Well, that didn't work. Uh, they were, in fact, shooting at St. Michael's. It was a major target. And a shell glanced the steeple and rocketed through the plaza behind, uh, striking the arm off the statue of William Pitt. Again, the congregation helpless to do anything about it. The British also spared, they spared some churches. So, as the story goes, the Church of St. James Santee in Berkeley was spared because of the British coat of arms displayed prominently above its door. I don't buy it. Now, that's the, that's the myth. I believe that that's be, the reason that they spared the church was because the loyalist sentiment in that area, Goose Creek. Goose Creek had a number of loyalists, a number of planters that supported the British cause. I think it was sort of an act of appreciation, perhaps. Uh, not to destroy that church. The British also pilfered the churches of their records so for, uh, and their valuables. So they took the bells of St. Michael's upon their retreat. Um, they took the Bible of St. James Santee. They took the um, plate and other records, other belongings of Christ Church Parish. So it was a time of great uh, loss and destruction. Now, St. Michael's did get its bells back eventually. St. James did get its Bible back when one of its former members discovered the Bible in a shop in London. But a lot of damage had been done. So I'd like to conclude by just suggesting that the alarm of war applied to all of the three major churches and at different times. Now, this is initially a battle over hearts and minds in Charleston and the back country talk about this establishment and the Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Baptists, and Episcopalians, all of them felt the pressures of the war. All of them felt the destruction. Um, their congregations shattered. Many of their members uh, killed. Uh, their churches destroyed in many cases. So it was quite a trying time. But there would be post-war reco recovery, rebuilding, and change. It just came very slowly. Perhaps one of the biggest legacies of the war is the rebuilding of the Baptist Church and the increasing percentage of Baptists in South Carolina, and also the leadership of Richard Furman. But for many, there was such devastation that it took decades to rebuild their churches and to put their congregations back together and to reorganize. So I hope this provides a little background of what was going on for these people. And I want to thank you for listening. Look forward to any questions you might have. Because if they, you know, at some point you figure you're going to have to run for it, and as you shed this stuff, there's certain things you really want to keep. The Norman the First Order, they always carry. Like I said, I have my hanger here, but you know, this is the double hanger. I'm a sergeant major, Norman, so I have my bayonet usually attached to the sword. The bayonet always go on first, because no matter wherever the men were in camp, they're always armed with a bayonet. The next thing would go on was the cartridge box. And over top of the cartridge box would be their canteens if they have them, haversacks or anything, or the equipment in. With the muskets at the time, for anyone to join the service, you only had one major requirement. Two opposing teeth. That's it. Everything else could be waverable, you'll still join the ranks, it's fine. The idea of most of the armies back then, they would load from a paper, paper cartridge. It's a lot faster. Trying, instead of trying to load from a horn, pour it down, because you have to measure it, it takes time. When you're on the battlefield, the soldier didn't have that opportunity. So they used to make three main paper cartridges with about 80 to 100 grains of powder and the ball in it. So in order to join the service, you have to have two pairs of teeth so you can bite the cartridge and pour it into the, into the muskets themselves. Now, one thing about the traditions about the muskets is we still use a lot of the terminology today. When you own everything, you own everything lock, stock, and barrel, right? Lock, stock, barrel. 
Another key sneak thing about the muskets is we have a half cock, which prevents from going off. So you have a tendency to fly off the handle, you have a tendency to go off half cocked. That's because when you're loading, the musket is right here. You don't want it to go off at half cock, it's right here in front of your face. And then, of course, as you load, first thing you do is when four cartridges in the pan, close to frizzing, if you get a flash in the pan, which means nothing has happened, it's because the powder is discharged in the pan and nothing has happened. The way the manual arm was taught to a lot of soldiers back then was based on some old tactics. Uh, the original 1764 drill, which the British used, but a lot of South Carolina units used leading up to the war, was make ready, present, and fire. Notice no aim anywhere in there <laughs> for a reason. The average shoulder normally, if he's not, the muskets to the side, the rest of the up here on your shoulder. But make ready, all of them to turn their hands and bring the musket up. This is from the days of the matchlocks, where literally they would take the, the stand and connect it to the musket. They just transferred it to here. And then it was present, in which they brought it down. An old British command used to be of closed eyes. Now if you notice, we here we have these brass uh, deflectors along. That's a modern safety. Back then they didn't have them. When this thing explodes, not only does it go up, it goes out. And now imagine everyone standing now shoulder to shoulder, and all this is going right along everyone's eyes. The British realized this in their course of the 1750s, so they used to give the command of close eyes. They would literally turn their heads and not aim. We were actually taught that they would make ready, present, and fire. We don't aim. Now, if you understand the way that the muskets were, uh, more this is French shell, but it's 69 caliber, the brown vest was 75 caliber. Solid lead ounce ball. The way the muskets work, especially with the cartridges, in order for the ball to go down the bore without touching, is not the same diameter as the barrel. The ball will literally drop straight down. So this may be a 69 caliber musket, the ball you're loading may be 65 or 64. And depending on the supply, especially Mary and his men, that's the nose of a carrying buckshot, swan shot. They only have, you know, they find it, all they just take a handful, they pour it down the barrel and fire it up because they just didn't have the lead to redo the musket ball to give them the load. Normally, the load procedure would go to tow the you know, charge of cartridge, and reach in the back here and box. Normally, these boxes carried 18 to 26 cartridges. They're going to pull it out, bring it to the tube. Bite down. And as I tell my recruits, there should be tasting powder to make sure they broke all the way through. All they're going to do is they're going to pour it up to fill the pan, and then they're close it. They're going to hold the cartridge still in their palm, and they're going to rotate the musket over. They bring their hand up from underneath to pour the rest of it in, squeeze out the bullet. Now, normally, they won't use the ramrod first or second rounds, but they have to towards the end because the, the powder is following up so bad that they have to ram. This is where discipline and training really pays off because if the young soldier forgets to remove his ramrod and fires his musket, now he has a 13 pound club because he won't be able to load it effectively again. Once it's rammed, it comes back up to the shoulder. They're just going to make, make ready, present, and fire. Fire large explosion, a lot of smoke, uh, especially with the the way the grade of the gunfire was back then, the fog of war really existed. The idea back then, especially by British tactics, was the musket was a noisemaker. The idea was to close with the bayonet because the muskets were so inaccurate. Even with 500 men on line, you still have all this balls flying down a range. If you're at 50 yards, you might hit somebody. Beyond 50, you're really rolling the dice because the balls are coming out different, different matter. They're going everywhere. And that's even guaranteeing if the musket went off. The human conditions that we have outdoors help gum up the powder. They may not shoot. Operating in the swamps, for sure, powder may or may not go off. But the key was to get close enough to drive home the bayonet. And that's what the British used their muskets for, to advance online to get close enough to charge with the bayonet. Up till 77, the American forces did not have bayonets. 
and we're pretty much charged off the field. Contrary to most belief, the bayonets were dull. They were not sharpened. The reason being is if you actually drive your bayonet into somebody with a sharp blade, it will get stuck in the body. And now you gotta sit there and try to pull it out. I really don't have to sink all this into you to get you to go away. I just gotta get about that much to encourage you to go the opposite direction quickly, which is what they did. So we finally learned how to use the bayonet, we were always charged off the field. But then they get out of line, but again, depending on what supply systems they had, a lot of the, the militia had the first model brown vests, which was actually of that much longer, left over from the Union War. The second models are recovered. The French, depending on the lead, it may or may not fit. And you had swan shot, buff shot, big shot, little shot, rocks, anything they could find. Sometimes during the battle, only seven cartridges. And then tried to recover off the bodies that they can during the fight. Um, that's pretty much how they use it. And then online, linear tactics, forward and back. With the rifle, on the other hand, and then that most people get misunderstood about it. everything called, well, guns are rifle. All the muskets were smooth bores. There was no rifling at all to help the spin of the ball make it accurate. That's why they were you know, only accurate after maybe 50 yards in a good day. The rifles were brought over by the Germans to Lancaster, Pennsylvania back in the 1740s. They're the ones that brought the technology of actually boring out the rifle bore so when the ball sits in there, it spins and comes up more accurate. Rifles had an effective range up to 300 yards. I can kill somebody versus 50. The difference is I can load and fire a musket once every 40 or 15 seconds or an average soldier once every 20. It takes 45 seconds to a minute to load this. Because when you're loading a rifle, you can normally load it from a cartridge or you load it, but you have to load it from the horn. But once you put the powder in, you've got to start the ball. It's normally patched and because the ball's so tight, you're literally sitting there trying to jam the bullet down. As more times you fire your, your rifle, it's being coated on the inside with more powder. That slows it down. So it takes up to a minute. The also thing on the end of this, there's nothing to put a bang in. By modern military tactics, a military arm has to have a bayonet. That's why the rifle was never adapted and accepted as a military arm because they couldn't put a bayonet on. Still, you get to select a few riflemen, which Marion and a few of his men should proven. You can start picking off officers at long range. You got a lot of British officers, nice gorgets, a lot of legs, easy to identify in the field and take them out. That's what almost happened to General Washington because both sides had riflemen. Not just the, the Hessian Jaegers themselves, but even the British learned during the French Union War to use riflemen. Patrick Ferguson is a good example. He created his own rifle. And he almost had General Washington dead to rights in the Battle of Brandywine. And he was an expert shot, and he had a clear shot, you know, George Washington not being a short man, on a horse. He had a rifle and had him dead to rights. But he felt it was very improper of him to shoot this gentleman in the back because he was really carrying himself in a professional manner and wouldn't be right. Had he shot General Washington and him changed the course of the war, they would have killed him right on the spot. But once the rifle is loaded, but they go through the same thing, they still have to put powder in the pan. Cock it, just takes a while to get it down inside the board, but once it fires, it'll reach out to 300 yards. More effective. That's why the, usually the riflemen will work in conjunction with the infantry because they'll be covering them with fire while the rifle will come up. But contrary to you know, everything else, only about 20% of the wounds suffered in the war were by bullets, the rest were by blades. And even these, the swords carried by the cavalry, by the infantry, were dull. For that same reason, you don't want to stick this into a body because the cavity would seal on it and get caught. Versus me go up and hit somebody with it and break an arm, break a leg. Now two of them have to carry him off the field. That's three removed from the fight versus just one. I believe presented at every one of our symposiums. And uh, it's always, always difficult for me to introduce someone of that prestige. World famous, highly acclaimed author, uh, wife of a military officer for 20 years, and then uh, he has uh, been the husband of this famous person for 
enslaved with all this high-tech stuff. They don't have a microphone that will work. <laughs> so I'm here <clears throat> with my teacher voice. Uh, yes, George, I've been here every year uh, following the career of Francis Mary. I am not an, hist an historian. I am a storyteller. And I think the Southern Campaign is a great story. Now, as a retired teacher, I would like to give you a test over what you recall from the last four years. But that's impractical. So I'm going to have to do a little review. What happened here after Utah Springs is very much related to what the British intended in the Southern strategy. And so I want to talk about that for a bit. You know that the war in the North was at a stalemate. The last battle in the North where the British Army and the American Army faced each other was at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in July of 1778. That's three years before Yorktown. Wouldn't you think that somebody would have figured out that something was going on someplace? And what was going on was the Southern strategy. How we got this Southern strategy is very, very interesting if you look at what was happening in Britain politically. England was tired of the war. After Saratoga, they were practically broke. Taxes had gone up tenfold. They were supposed to have a quick victory, and the war's dragging on. They're paying 30,000 Hessians, and the people are sick of it. The Parliament wants to end the war, and the king won't hear of that. Now, we think of George III as a tyrant, but he was a constitutional monarch. And he had to get funds from Parliament. And when Lord North and Lord Germain came up with this idea of sweeping through the South, <coughs> how are they going to sell it to Parliament? Well, with a little chicanery, <clears throat> as you can imagine. They said to the bank ventures, who are mostly merchants and shippers, we can let New England go if we can get and keep the South. Shippers and merchants in England were happy to hear that because they were in conflict, in competition with the New Englanders, whom they thought were difficult to get along with and they were perfectly happy to cut them up. The argument then for Parliament is, what is the advantage of taking the South? Well, the shippers, had a huge merchant navy. The British government had a huge navy, and those ships were all wooden. And what did the South have to offer? Lumber, turpentine, char, and hemp. And they also had rice, which could be shipped to the islands where they were growing sugar and byproducts, molasses, and rum. It seems that the British Navy and Army was fueled by rum. <laughs> and where could they get rum? The exports from the islands was a source of the greatest wealth from the colonies for Great Britain. And so they passed the funding bill through Parliament. But the understanding was this is the last <coughs> large amount of money we're going to put in this war. So the war would be won or lost in the South. And if it wasn't won in the South, the war would be aborted. Now, one of the reasons that they thought it was going to work was that they had all of these loyalists in the South. And then they thought in the bad country, most of the people would come to the aid of the king. Why they thought those Scots-Irish Presbyterians who hated the British and hated the Church of England would have anything to do with King George III. I don't know, but evidently they did. But it wasn't going to work, although it worked at first. It worked up until the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Up until that time, all of South Carolina and Georgia was under British control. But after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in March 1781, 
Nathaniel Green had to make a decision. Cornwallis had won the battle, and he was headed for Wilmington with his bloodied up army. Green had to decide, was he going to follow Cornwallis? Or was he going to turn south? And you all know he turned south. For a very good reason. Green understood, even if Cornwallis didn't, the war had to be over reasonably soon. England had to lose. They <clears throat> were running short of men, money, and materiel. Cornwallis and his army had taken tremendous casualties, and it was a matter of time, and time was on the side of Nathaniel Green. Now, I think Green was probably the brightest, most capable general in the American Revolution. He might have been the brightest man of the age, if you exclude maybe Benjamin Franklin, but Green understood what Cornwallis ignored. The war would be over, but when the war is over, England would keep all it occupied. That was international law at the time. It's called uti facitidis, what you hold, you keep. And if the war had ended shortly after the Battle of Gilbert Courthouse, England would have kept Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. They hadn't yet got to Virginia, but they had almost all of what they wanted in the South. Now, if, that had, if they had been successful, at your baseball games, you would start <coughs> the program with God Save the Queen. Did you ever think of that? If, if, if Green had failed. So, Green turns into the South, and he's going to have to depend on militia. And he has three militia generals. Andrew Pickens, Thomas Sumter, and Francis Mary. He also has some very capable militia colonels. Elijah Clark, he's got Shelby and Sevier in the bad country. And he lets them all know that he is coming south. Now, it's going to be a race. Will Green take back the south before Cornwallis has to surrender? And we'll see. He did make it by not, but not by much. Now, if you remember, Langworth Harry Lee came into the South then uh, to campaign with Francis Marion. Now, Green had, at first, the three generals that he could count on. He could count on Andrew Pickens. After all, Pickens had commanded at the militia at Cowpens. He could depend on Thomas Sumter, who had done tremendous damage to the British. And he could depend on Francis Marion. So he moved south, and although things went very well at first, by the time of the, of the Battle of Utah Springs, Sumter is no longer a player. Now, he was a brave general, but he was not a team player. And by the time of the Battle of Utah Springs, he is no longer involved. And I'll let him speak for himself the next hour. And he can explain how all of that came about. But the Battle of Monk at, the, uh, at Utah Springs. And I think the Americans won. All the correspondence suggests the Americans won for the first 20 years after the battle. And then all of a sudden, somebody decided the British won. And I still don't understand that. But when Green left the battlefield that afternoon, he uh, uh, had a strong picket on the field, and uh, he moved back to regroup and to take care of his wounded. Now, all of the commanding officers of the Continental Army at the Battle of Utah Springs were wounded or killed, with the exception of Light Horse Harry Lee, Colonel Otho Williams. Now, Marion is a Continental officer, but he is acting as militia there, so they didn't count him. But you know, Francis Marion survived that battle unscathed. 
Perhaps the greatest tragedy of that battle is the wounding of Andrew Higgins. First, they thought he was dead. A bullet hit him in the chest, and, uh, and he was knocked off his horse unconscious. His men carted him off, thinking that he was dead. But the bullet had hit the buckle of his sword belt, which was slung across his shoulders. And the buckle was driven into his bone, so it was very painful. And it was severe, but it was not mortal. But it puts Andrew Pickens now out of the chain of command uh, for quite some time. And it leaves Francis Marion as the only Brigadier General of Militia active in the South after the Battle of Utah Springs. The correspondence after the Battle of uh, Utah Springs is very interesting because Green reports a victory, Oka Williams reports a victory, Washington congratulates Green, Congress awards a medal to Green for winning at Utah Springs, and an Ansbacher at Yorktown in his journal writes about the battle that had occurred in the Utahs and said the British lost. So I leave it up to you. How could they all be wrong? After the Battle of Utah Springs, Green expected to return the next day and finish off the British. Um, he had to be moved up the, back up to Riddell's uh, plantation. And he sent Lightburst Harry Lee and Marion down the, the Monk's Corner Road to get behind Stuart in case Stuart tried to withdraw immediately. And when Green arrived at the battlefield the next day, Stuart was planning to leave. Uh, I understand that the weather was not very good. They didn't want to use the weapons because of the black powder problems in the dam. And besides, Green was getting what he wanted. He'd already pushed the British out of Camden, out of 96, out of Augusta, and into this small area along the Santee River, and now, he was pushing them out of the Utah Springs area. So he was accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish. He was taking back the territory. Now shortly after that, we find from William James that while Marion and Lee were on the Monk's Corner Road, they found that MacArthur was moving toward the British with supplies. And so, William James reported to fight between two fires was hazardous. And so Lee and Marion disappeared into the swamp rather than have to fight in front and behind. So the day after the battle, Marion and Lee <coughs> follow in behind Stuart and MacArthur and start picking off stragglers. In fact, Lee reports that he took some wagons of wounded. And it appears that he removed the American wounded from the, from the wagons and let the wagons go on to Charleston with the British uh, wounded. Green follows Ferguson, I'm sorry, follows Stewart down the Monk's Corner Road to Ferguson's Swamp. And at Martin's Tavern writes a report to Cornwallis. Now, that report is not quite accurate because uh, he didn't mention all of the prisoners that he, or all of the men that he had lost who were now prisoners because Lee and Marion are taken prisoners. There were a lot of prisoners taken at the battle. There were prisoners taken in skirmishes before the battle. The people who were digging potatoes had been policed up. Um, so Stuart writes a rather optimistic report of that battle. And then he moves on toward Charleston. And the next day, Green arrives at, at Ferguson Swamp, and he writes a report from Martin's Tavern uh, telling about the battle. Now, there was no advantage in Green following Stuart any further toward Charleston. Uh, Lee is uh, still in the field, and Green returns to the battlefield at Utah Springs, and he buries the dead. Now, 
other commanders had all had commented, the victor buries the, gets to bury the dead. Uh, the other reason that I am reasonably sure that the British uh, lost that battle is they did not bury their dead, and they did not take all of their wounded off the field. Uh, my conclusion is they didn't control enough of the field to recover the bodies and to recover the wounded. But anyway, Green buried the dead, police up the wounded, British and American, and moves back up to the high hills of the Santee. His army is in terrible shape. Lee reports that they are sicker than they have ever been. And he does mention that Marion's men are not ill, and he thinks it's because they're used to the swamp. But it also may be because Marion didn't camp in those huge camps with, uh, with Green, and uh, as we heard from Peter Ory this morning, uh, they camped in the swamp. And so if you think of contagion, that may be why uh, at this point uh, they, they were in good shape. Although there is some correspondence between Marion and Green where Marion says that he has been ill, but not too ill to ride his horse. Now I thought that because Marion drank vinegar and water, that he was immune from the disease of the swamps, but evidently he did uh, occasionally get sick. Now, Green is at High Hills, Marion. We break for a second. Okay. The correspondence in this period continues. Governor Rutledge writes to Marion uh, his concerns about uh, security in the area, and he starts his letter by saying, I think after the glorious victory at Utah, the, the, another primary source here. Uh, some of my scholar friends are just very terribly interested in primary sources. Um, on September the 27th, Governor Rutledge decides that he could pardon the loyalists if they appeared before a brigadier general of the militia and took a loyalty oath and served six months in the Patriot militia. Then all their sins would be forgiven. They could even retain their property if they met those requirements. Wouldn't you like to think that six months good behavior and all of your sins would be forgiven? <laughs> well, what militia general? There's only one. And Marion is going to have to deal with that. Now, Green writes to Marion they need to be vigilant in case Cornwallis breaks out of the siege at Yorktown and comes back into South Carolina. From here on, Rutledge has an agenda, which includes Marion's help. Green has an agenda, which includes Marion's help. And Marion is, from now on, he has more on his plate than he can say grace over. The demands on Marion this last year, when things were supposed to be winding down, is tremendous. Now, there's a concern about the British. Now remember, early on, when the British occupied the state, they had British troops in Charleston. Now, they've got troops that were taken from Camden, here in Charleston, from Fort Mott, Fort Watson, Granby, 96, at least they didn't have to absorb the Augusta troops because they went to Savannah. But all of these troops are in Charleston. In addition, they've got all these Tories that came, that evacuated with them, and their slaves. How are they going to feed them? They're going to have to raid the plantations along the coast for cattle, for rice, and foodstuffs, and who is expected to stop them? Francis Marion. Now, Marion had to deal with the mounting rivalry between Ori and Mahan. And I'll not go into that because you heard about that this morning from Peter Ori himself. Cornwallis was defeated at Yorktown 
the middle of October the 19th, I believe. The word didn't get down to this area until much later. And Marion is at Candy's Plantation, which I think is here in Clarendon County. Um, Marion decides to have a ball for his officers and invite the ladies of the area. Now, as I said, I'm a storyteller, and, and some of these things go through my head. And I'm thinking of the drama. For a week before the ball, Colonel Isaac Shelby arrives in the area with the over mountain men. And Shelby's men are mountain fighters. They were at Moscow's Mill and uh, Kings Mountain. They have been living in Indian country, so they fight Indians. And they were dressed a little differently. They wore a lot of leather because they were hunters and they tanned hides. But they also carried a long rifle, a tomahawk, a scalping knife, and they were proficient in the use of all of them. They were known in the back country by the British as the yelling boys. Because when they went into battle, they met out one ungodly war hoop that they learned from the Indians. Now, later on in the Civil War, it was known as the Rebel Yell. But it came out of the mountains and Shelby with Shelby's men. Now, were those officers invited to Marion's Ball? <laughs> And if they were, what did the local ladies think of those people? Uh, it's just a thought. Now, Green had sent Light Horse Harry Lee to Washington and asked for more troops because he felt now was the time to rid the South of the British. If he had sufficient troops and if the French Navy attacked by sea, they could take care of the British in short order. But the French Navy had gone down in the islands, and Congress never saw fit to send any more troops down here to Green. So everything that had to be done in the South would have to be done by the survivors in the Continental Army, the survivors of Utah Springs, and Francis Marion, Marion's militia because Isaac Shelby and his mountain men didn't stay long. They did a little campaigning with Mahan, uh, but they didn't particularly like the weather, they didn't like the terrain, they didn't like the way the uh, swamp militia handled their battles, and so they went back uh, to their mountains. And you can't fault them totally because the Cherokee War is still going on in the mountains. And uh, the British were taken prisoners and uh, turning them over to the Indians to be tortured and killed. And so these people may have had a very good reason, other than the fact that they didn't like the area, uh, to return to the mountains. Now, finally, we have about February, the British government will fall. So it takes time, you know, they, they finally got the word about Yorktown and uh, Parliament was dissolved and the new Parliament went in under the pits, uh, the opposition, and they had opposed the war all along and so the new Parliament is going to end the war. But it's going to take them a while to get around to it and in the meantime, Rutledge realizes that to have a legitimate claim to the colony, he has to have a civilian government. Uh, They're also working on a civilian government in, in Georgia. Uh, General Anthony Wayne is there, but he needs to have a civilian government. And he decides on Jacksonboro as the seat of the legislature. That's only 32 miles from Charleston. Now, the people that were uh, elected, and, and we heard this morning from Peter Horry, he was there. Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter were senators. Uh, Andrew Pickens was a representative. But also, in that legislative assembly were names synonymous with the militia activity in the whole state. 
We had Lacey, Thomas, Hill, Henderson, Brandon, Hampton, Wynn, Lyles, and a lot more. And now they're at Jacksonboro, and you ever wonder how come Bloody Bill Cunningham was able to go sweeping through and, and attack Dickie Felder up at the Walnut?